So, I mean, that should, Echoing Green is amazing. It's like 27 years, has graduated cohort after cohort uh, through, their, through their programs, and I can't think of another entrepreneur network uh, and, and support system that is as long tenured and success. Oh, wait, actually, I can. It's Ashoka. Ha! Ashoka, Bill Drayton's been running Ashoka for more than 30 years. Uh, they are a global entity on so many uh, cuts. You want to go geography, sector, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they are everywhere. And so we thought it would be amazing to get Bill up here to get into conversation uh, with Eric Branham, who's actually the CEO of Mission Hub, which runs SOCAP and, and a bunch of impact hubs around the United States, to really go deep on what they are plumbing in terms of learning. So I want to turn it over to Eric Branham and Bill Drayton, and please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I know the question has been asked a number of times in terms of folks' first uh, SOCAP, but again, raise your hand if this is your first SOCAP ever. And it is mine as well. I feel a little bit like Stephen Colbert on The Late Show. I was sort of like the new gig. I feel like I need like a band and come out dancing or something like that. But that's amazing. I am uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, I joined as CEO of Mission Hub uh, seven months ago, and I'll talk a little bit about Mission Hub before bringing Bill onto the stage. But um, you know, I'm in my mid-40s, uh, and this is the world of impact and social entrepreneurship is relatively new for me. Um, you know, folks in their mid-40s is that classic kind of midlife crisis time. Uh, you know, some people find God. I like to think that I found good and uh, get to join you here on stage. So um, I did start life as a climate scientist. Uh, I was a carbon dioxide researcher at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, working in the uh, lab of Dr. David Keeling. Um, and worked on the famous Kaling Curve, uh, both in atmospheric and, uh, and seawater uh, carbon dioxide. So um, it has been really fun to move through the technology industry, through the worlds of startups and entrepreneurship, and eventually working on platforms for innovation, which has actually brought me here to uh, Mission Hub. Um, what is Mission Hub, you say? Mm -hmm. How many of you actually know what, who Mission Hub is? Actually, it'll be like four people in the audience. Mission Hub. Um, one of our objectives and goals actually here at SOCAP was to talk about Mission Hub and actually raise the awareness of the mission of Mission Hub. Uh, we are the parent company of SOCAP. Uh, we actually are the, um, a network of campuses, Impact Hub co-working campuses here in the United States. And in your program books on the sort of the second and third pages, it talks a bit about who Mission Hub is and we have this notion that SOCAP is really powered by Mission Hub. Um, I view Mission Hub as a marketplace, a marketplace that is building the future of social innovation with you all as parts of that. We are a marketplace of ideas, like the SOCAP conference. We are a marketplace for skills and learning. Uh, one of the new programs that we're launching at SOCAP 15 is SOCAP 365, which is actually bringing the content, the rich content from this conference out to our five campuses into weekly programming so that we can inspire and teach the next generation of impact investors and social entrepreneurs. We are a physical marketplace for the goods and services that social entrepreneurs need to launch and grow. Uh, yesterday, Sam Utney, Sam out here, I know he was in the back there. Sam is the managing director of Impact Hub New York City, which is a mission hub uh, company, and uh, talked about the Impact Bazaar, which is this physical marketplace for these goods and services. Hey, Brian. Well, Brian Breckenridge from Box.org, thank you for joining us. Um, we are a marketplace for financial capital. Our Philadelphia campus, we are going to be building a world-leading center of expertise around impact investing and continue to take this amazing uh, fabric that we are weaving together and bring it to market. And lastly, and ultimately, we are a marketplace that transcends place. Um, you have, may have seen SOCAP TV, which we're launching at SOCAP this year, SOCAP 15, which is recording much of the content and uh, snippets and bringing it online to a worldwide audience so that they can view and interact with what we're doing. So first off, thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me uh, share the stage with you this morning. And uh, I am thrilled to bring onto the stage uh, a man who probably needs no introduction to the vast majority of people in this room, but I will introduce him nonetheless. Uh, Bill Drayton is the CEO and founder of Ashoka, Innovators for the Public, whose vision is an everyone a change maker world, where anyone can apply the ch skills of change making to solve complex social problems. 
Bill pioneered the field of social entrepreneurship as a Harvard undergrad, as a Yale uh, student at Yale Law School, a management consultant at McKinsey, at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and as a MacArthur Fellow. He's taught law and management at Stanford Law School and at Harvey, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and serves on the boards of Get America Working and Youth Venture. Please join me in giving a very, very warm SOCAP welcome to Mr. Bill Drayton. Thank you, John. Thank you so Good much. Nice to see you. Hi. Nice to see you. So we were talking actually before this, Bill, and this is your first SOCAP as well in terms of physically being uh, here, but have interacted and seen some of our great content uh, to, to date. So thank you for, for joining us. Um, Bill, you're a lifetime social entrepreneur and have been at the helm of Ashoka since you founded it in 1980. After more than 35 years, what is unique about this moment for Ashoka? Well, I think everyone here knows the answer to that. We know deeply that we are a transition point, the most amazing transition point ever. Uh, that's why SOCAP is so important. It's a key part of that transition. And Ashoka is very privileged uh, to be able to see the patterns because of the 3,000 fellows, because of our many other partners. And in brief summary, uh, the world has been organized for mill millennia for efficiency and repetition. So think assembly line law firm. But since 1700, the rate of change after being static has been escalating exponentially. That's just a fact. And so a world of giving people a skill which they will then repeat for their life doesn't work anymore. And that way of organizing doesn't work anymore. Instead, we are living in a world of change which is the opposite of repetition. And we have to organize differently and everyone has to have different skills. So uh, seeing this and realizing that we're at the turning point, uh, I think we all, everyone here has a responsibility to help the world through that transition. And the key part is helping people see it. Once you see it, then you know what to do, especially when the people around you also see it. So it's a frame change moment, and thank you to SOCAP and everyone here for being a key part of that. Thank you. You mentioned, Bill, the, the, the scale of the um, Ashoka Fellows Program, 3,300 fellows across 85 countries. With, with now uh, uh, an, an organization of that scale and size, what are some of the patterns that you see, you're seeing to emerge from, from the fellows themselves? Well, I've just mentioned the most important one, but um, first of all, let me introduce who the fellows are. Uh, <clears throat> over half of them have changed national policy within five years of launch, and three quarters the pattern in the field. So these are extraordinary people, organizations, and movements, and we would be blind if we didn't see the patterns. And that is really, really important. Uh, it's not only seeing where we're going, but how to get there. And so let me just give you an example. Now, the largest single group of Ashoka Fellows focuses on children and young people, which is probably true for everyone here in our personal lives. Uh, and there's an extremely obvious pattern. 95% of them put kids in charge, which is not what the schools do. It's not what most parents do. Um, it's a very different model. Um, they're also, you can see that pattern in another way because over 80% of the Ashoka Fellows started something when they were in their teens, or usually early teens. And so, if I just summarize this pattern, you can see immediately how it fits a world where everyone has to be a change maker. The new definition of success in growing up, and therefore education, is every young child must master empathy and guide their lives by that. And then when they become a young person around 12, um, they have to practice and practice being a change maker. 
Now, what I've just said is coming from the reality of a world where everything's changing and where you need everyone to be a change maker, any young person who doesn't have these skills is not going to make it. Mm. Any society, any city, any group that doesn't make sure that this generation of children and young people have those skills is in deep, deep, and fast trouble. Um, so that is a, uh, this is like, just a, this is like a uh, hundred years ago saying we needed everyone to be literate in written language. We needed people to read street signs and manuals. No one's ever agreed about how to do that, but that's just a fact. And we're now at a moment where these other skills, cognitive empathy, sophisticated teamwork, a completely opposite type of leadership and change making is necessary. So that is a pattern. And the final point about it is it fits the everyone a change maker world. And you can see that in field after field. The fellows dealing with health, what patients, friends, family, neighbors, peers in charge. Oh, that fits. So. Okay. As a part of that, as Ashoka shifted from just supporting individual entrepreneurs to this notion of the world, right? Everyone a change maker. How did that open up new possibilities for Ashoka as an organization, the way that you were organized? So, um, uh, we've historically been organized as a series of uh, individual entrepreneurs with a team. Finding the best ideas, entrepreneurs helping them get started building a community in Nigeria or Poland or whatever. When you have to take on, how are we going to change the framework of thinking, for example, about growing up? Well, then all the pieces have to work together. We have to become a fluid, open team of teams just as much as everyone else. And that's a very different way of organizing. Over the last, I'd say, couple of years, we've learned something very profoundly powerful, which is collaborative entrepreneurship jujitsu. So, okay, we see this new pattern. Every young person must practice and practice being a change maker. And that means that schools have to be in everyone a change maker culture. Well, how do we, and, and that fits the everyone a change maker world. You have to do that. Well, then how do we get people to see it? Well, entrepreneurs are always a small force tipping the system. How do we do that together? And so this is amazing uh, that we're actually succeeding at this. And we've, there, there are four stages. The first is the trigger. What's the least number of forces you need to set in motion that will create a self-multiplying dynamic? leadership teams in a few schools, a few writers and publishers, and leadership from some fellows. That has already led in the US to 12 graduate schools of education, to ministers of education. Uh, we're looking to uh, bring on teachers' unions. Uh, wholesale partners have to pick up in the next stage, and you have to make it open. The third stage, once millions of people see it and are talking and it's the subject of conversation, how do you make sure that the conversation is as sharply focused, as intelligent as possible? How do you provide the flow of anecdotes? And then finally, institutionalization. That's a completely new thing, and it's incredibly powerful. And in a world where you have to have fluid open teams of teams, this is a really important one. Whenever there's a critical mass of social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs bringing major change for the good of all, they need to be able to get together to be as powerful as possible. And that's what collaborative entrepreneurship jujitsu does. That's one of the things we talked about uh, before coming up is um, talking about that that 12-year-old. So I have three kids, an 8-year-old boy, a 10-year-old girl, and a 10-year-old girl and a 12-year-old girl. Uh, who are super fun and amazing. 
what, what is your message to my 12-year-old daughter, Sophie, who's uh, out there trying to find her own sort of identity in the universe? And frankly, part of my motivation of, of coming into this role is, is trying to be an inspiring person for her and to engage her with this universe of change. What, what is your message to Sophie? Well, uh, given this framework change, uh, we have something called Ashoka's Youth Venture. And the goal is to help any young person anywhere have their own dream, build their own team, and change their school or neighborhood. Anyone who's done that has, they are a change maker. So let me tell you a, a, a story that I found very powerful. We had a meeting of about 350 US Youth Ventures I, I sit down at lunch, and this very tiny young woman comes down and sits to my right. So I turn to and she introduces herself and says, I'm 12 because she's sick of people thinking she's eight, probably. <laughs> and so I ask her, well, what's your venture? And she said, oh, well, my brother's autistic. And all through school, I would cry when he was mistreated. But now we fix that. Oh, well, how did you do that? Well, we get together whenever we see a special student not being treated well, and we figure out what to do. And then we go and do it, and we're very persistent. Now, that's 90% her words, word for word. And if you were there, you would not have one cell of doubt that she is a change maker, that she knows it that she's never going to be afraid in her life. And she's going to get better and better at this. She is able to express love and respect in action in a powerful way, and she knows it. She's also brought a whole bunch of kids along with her. She has her PhD, and the most important skill she has to have to contribute in a world of change. There is huge demand for people with those skills. The people in this room don't understand, because we all have that gift, what it's like not to have it. It's terrifying. It's the worst. Now, I asked her one other question. How many student groups are there in Shirley Middle School, which is a poor rural school which has flight of talent from the community as fast as possible? It's an Appalachian-like environment. Oh, over 50. Well, if there's one-tenth of one percent of all the middle and high schools in the world that have 50 student groups, I'd be surprised. One guy in that community eight years ago took the youth venture idea and said, this is how we turn it around. If we've got a community of change makers, we're a magnet, people aren't fleeing. And he made it happen. So when she at 11 went into Shirley Middle School, she had a problem, and everybody said to her, you got a problem, you solve it, you build a team, look around, that's the way it's done. And she did. Now, what we all have to do is make sure that every middle and high school in the world is in every one a change maker world, so it is the norm. It's not exceptional to be a change maker because the world needs everyone to be change makers. And it's cruel, it's awful to allow any person not to have those skills. So there's very direct action here. Everyone here knows a young person. The next time she says, something is amiss, put your book down and quietly say, well, how do you think you could solve that problem? Who, well, why don't you get your friends together and fix it? Me? Yeah, you can do this. And this is the most important thing you can do. And here's why. And it's OK to drop piano practice. Uh, you know, anyone can do that. And we need to do that for ourselves, for our friends, for our coworkers. And we also have to do it for the organizations we care about. This is a very challenging transition from hierarchy and stovepipes and repetition to an everyone a change maker organization. And just think about this strategic environment. Everyone is bumping everyone else. Everyone is a change maker. They're better and better. Because of SOCAP and the web, the, the amplitude of bumping is accelerating. That's why the change curve is going up exponentially. It's just a fact. So you need everyone in your organization, whatever it is, to understand the environment they're dealing with. 
to see the changes, to understand them, to change, to help the people around you change, and to see the opportunities. And then everyone has to come together quickly. Oh, there's a big new value creating opportunity over here. And we have to create a new team of teams, a different constellation, because it's a new opportunity. And, and oh, by the way, you don't get to repeat that for 10 or 20 <laughs> years. That's um... So this is a different environment. You have to have everyone a change maker. And that affects every part of your life. And so I just urge you, give yourself permission to recognize this is the strategic change. This is a historic moment. And those who give themselves permission to have the courage to say, yes, this is happening, and this is really good. This is a much better world. That's a great opportunity to serve. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you for taking the time with us today. Welcome. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Hey, thanks. Thank you, Bill. Great.